When it comes to biblical words that are typically associated with the Apostle Paul, there is probably no word more misunderstood or frequently twisted to justify ongoing sin than the word grace. So whenever we think of grace, we must never forget that the scriptures warn, certain men have crept in unnoticed, who long ago were marked out for this condemnation, ungodly men, who turned the grace of our God into unrestrained filthiness, and deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. But I want to remind you, though you once knew this, that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who did not believe. Yes, even as the last books of the Bible were being written, false teachers were already trying to turn God's grace into an excuse for sin. And those false teachers were leading many people astray. But Scripture reminds us that we must understand God's grace in the light of the Exodus. By God's grace, those who put the blood on their doorway were passed over during the final plague in Egypt. By God's grace, they passed through the Red Sea on dry ground. By God's grace, they received the promise of a land flowing with milk and honey. And by God's grace, they heard God's voice and received God's commandments when he descended to Mount Sinai. With signs and wonders like manna and quail, God poured out his grace on the children of Israel when he took them by the hand to lead them through the wilderness. Meanwhile, Paul wrote, With most of them God was not well pleased, for their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. So the Apostle Paul warned, Now these things became our examples, to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted, and do not become idolaters as were some of them. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Nor let us commit sexual immorality, as some of them did, and in one day twenty-three thousand fell. Nor let us tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted and were destroyed by serpents. Nor complain, as some of them also complained and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now all these things happened to them as examples, and they were written for our admonition, upon whom the ends of the ages have come. Therefore let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. In many places, Scripture teaches us to understand our salvation by grace through faith in Christ, as being perfectly foreshadowed by the exodus of Israel. And when we see God's grace in the context of the exodus, we realize that we must obediently cooperate with God's grace and continue turning away from sin if we are to inherit the promises. This is why Paul plainly stated, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we, who died to sin, live any longer in it? Therefore, before we even begin to discuss grace, we must state from the start, grace is never a reason to disobey or to discard the moral laws of our God. No. When Scripture contrasts justification through the law to justification through grace, we will see that the Levitical law was what was being discussed, never the moral law. So, with Paul we can say, May anyone who teaches otherwise be accursed, for they are teaching a false gospel. And with that warning issued, we must understand 
It's not Scripture's fault that so many people misunderstand grace. No, the Bible teaches us everything we need to know about true biblical grace. In fact, if we search out the Greek word most often translated into English as grace, it appears in the Apostolic Scriptures 156 times, and it appears in the pre-apostolic Septuagint 78 times. However, when you search an English translation for the English word grace, you will find, instead of the word grace appearing 234 times, it only appears 129 times. Therefore, the careful student of the scriptures must ask, where are all of the missing passages about grace? And the answer to that important question can be seen in passages such as Luke 1.30. In Luke chapter 1 verse 30, within each of the following English translations, the Greek word for grace was translated as favor. In the American Standard Version, the Complete Jewish Bible, the Holman Christian Standard Bible, the Darby Translation, the English Standard Version, the God's Word Translation, the Hebrew Names Version, the King James Version, the Lexham English Bible, the New American Standard Bible, the New International Version, the New King James Version, the New Living Translation, the New Revised Standard, the Revised Standard Version, the Third Millennium Bible, the Webster Bible, the World English Bible, the Weymouth New Testament, and Young's Literal Translation. But all of these same translations render the same Greek word into English as grace in passages such as Ephesians 2.8, where it is written, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Obviously, the answer to the question, where are all of the missing passages about grace, is, the Greek word for grace is inconsistently translated. But most importantly, we must understand, it is translated in an inconsistent manner to reinforce the faulty theological suppositions that have developed over time surrounding the concept of grace. Meanwhile, the Greek word Paul used in Ephesians 2.8 was transliterated into English long ago. And the fact is, most of us would easily recognize the sound of the Greek word Paul used. We transliterate the first letter of the Greek word Paul used, the letter chi, that looks like the English letter X, into English as ch. We transliterate the second letter of the Greek word Paul used, the letter alpha, that looks like the English letter A, into English as A. We transliterate the third letter of the Greek word Paul used, the letter rho, that looks like the English letter P, into English as R. We transliterate the fourth letter of the Greek word Paul used, the letter iota, that looks like the English letter I, into English as I. We transliterate the fifth letter of the Greek word Paul used, the letter tau, that looks like the English letter T, into English as T. And we transliterate the sixth letter of the Greek word Paul used, the letter iota, that looks like an I, into English as I. So, when we sound out the English transliteration of the word Paul used in Ephesians 2.8, we see Paul used the word charity. Now, we typically write that word with a Y at the end, and we have slightly modified the meaning of the word over time. But even though Paul would pronounce the word a little differently, with a K sound at the beginning, Paul would definitely recognize our modern word, charity, as very similar to the word he used many times in his epistle. And we get a glimpse of the original meaning of the word charity, when we look at the second definition listed in Merriam-Webster's online dictionary, where they describe charity as benevolent goodwill. Please note 
the similar definition listed under the word favor, which they define as friendly regard shown toward another, especially by a superior. You see, the words charity and favor were once closely associated linguistically, but over time charity took on a specific context of generosity and helpfulness, especially towards the needy or suffering. Therefore, favor is now the better translation of the Greek word that is frequently but not consistently translated into English as grace. Now, many popular teachers these days define grace as unmerited favor. Therefore, Merriam-Webster's online dictionary reports the definition of grace as unmerited divine assistance given to humans for their regeneration or sanctification. But we need to consider if the word unmerited belongs in an accurate definition of grace. The word merit is defined as a praiseworthy quality or virtue or character or conduct deserving of reward, honor, or esteem. So, unmerited favor would be favor given without regard to the quality, virtue, character, or conduct of the recipient. Now, with this definition in mind, the first time the word grace is used in Scripture, the Bible records, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping thing, and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. This is the genealogy of Noah. Noah was a just man, perfect in his generations. Noah walked with God. In context, it would seem that Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord because Noah was a just man. Therefore, this passage does not seem to be teaching the concept that grace is unmerited favor, since it specifically lists the virtuous character of Noah. Also, the word found used in English translations of Genesis 6 comes from either a Hebrew verb that means to find or attain to, or a Greek verb that means to find a thing sought. And Noah is recorded as one who found grace in the eyes of the Lord, meaning Noah's conduct was involved in how he received God's grace. Therefore, the first mention of God's grace in the Bible includes information about the virtuous character of the recipient of God's grace and a verb that indicates the recipient found God's grace. Yes, as a shipwrecked mariner floating in the sea might look to the horizon for a ship to rescue them from their troubles, people can seek for and actually find grace. And the Bible mentions people finding grace, either with God or with someone in authority, 15 times in Genesis, 4 times in Exodus, 3 times in Numbers, 1 time in Deuteronomy, one time in Judges, three times in Ruth, six times in Samuel, three times in Second Samuel, one time in First Kings, seven times in Esther, four times in Proverbs, one time in Luke, one time in Acts, and one time in Hebrews. But finding is not the only verb ever associated with the word we translate as grace. No, there are other verbs connected with the word we translate as grace or favor in God's word. In Acts chapter 13, Luke records, Now when the congregation had broken up, many of the Jews and devout proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas, who, speaking to them, persuaded them to continue in the grace of God. The word translated as continue is epimeno, and it means to stay at or with. So Paul 
and Barnabas found it necessary to persuade people to remain or abide within God's grace. Just as a rescued mariner must remain on the ship that rescued him to safely make it home, we must continue in God's grace to the end with patience and endurance. Also, Paul and Timothy found it necessary to write to the saints in Corinth. We then, as workers together with him, also plead with you not to receive the grace of God in vain. Now, the word translated here as receive actually means to take hold of. Therefore, God's grace is not only something we must continue in, it's also something we can take hold of. And if we take hold of God's grace, but neglect to continue in God's grace, we prove we took hold of his grace in vain. Or in other words, when the glorious ship of grace arrives to save us from the murky waters of sin, we must choose to take hold of the rope of salvation if we are to be rescued and lifted from our hopeless condition. But later, if we abandon the ship of grace by choosing not to continue in it, we took hold of the rope of salvation in vain. And this leads us to Paul's letter to the Galatians where he wrote, You have become estranged from Christ, you who attempt to be justified by law. You have fallen from grace. Now the word Paul used that is here translated as fallen means to fall out of, to fall down from, or to fall off. So, much like how a rescued mariner can fall off the deck of a ship and end up back in the sea, we can fall from God's grace and return to the deadly waters of sin. And we must note that in this passage Paul revealed, a fall from grace occurs when a person attempts to be justified by the law. Therefore, if we choose to put our trust in the life vest of the Levitical law, we abandon the rescue vessel of grace and we return to the waters of sin Jesus already saved us from. So this is why Paul wrote, I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died in vain. If the life vest of the Levitical law could actually save us from sin, then the death of our Lord would serve no purpose. But just as a life vest cannot supply perfect dryness to anyone floating in the water, or carry that person to their anticipated destination, the law cannot make anyone righteous, nor can the law convey us to the promised land. The moral law that reveals the difference between the righteous and the sinner is like the surface of the water revealing the difference between the wet and the dry. And only those mythical people who have kept the moral law perfectly could ever say they didn't need Jesus to save them. The judicial law is like a series of warning signs floating on the water posted to caution against the consequences of being wet and, while judicial laws can help protect a society from totally drowning in sin, the judicial law can never save an individual from sin's murky depths. And the Levitical law is like a life vest, given to keep people from drowning in sin until rescue arrived. But those who choose the life vest of the Levitical law over the salvation Jesus Christ is offering will eventually die in their sins. None of these items can make a sinner righteous, and none of these items can carry us to the promised land. No, they can only serve to define, warn, and temporarily preserve until the true Savior arrives. Therefore, if anyone turns back to the Levitical law for righteousness, they set aside, reject, or refuse God's amazing grace.
Also, please note that Paul contrasts the law and grace here in this passage and connects God's grace with Jesus. This was a theme in Paul's epistles, and this passage is one of several that warn against rejecting God's grace by trusting in the Levitical law for righteousness. However, Paul was never contrasting all three categories of God's law against grace, because in Romans Paul wrote, Sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. What then? Shall we sin, because we are not under law, but under grace? Certainly not. Since sin is the violation of God's moral laws, and Paul clearly states that we are not to use grace as a license to sin, clearly grace is not opposed to God's moral law. No, like a ship compared to a life vest, God's grace allows us to float high above the waters of sin, safe and dry and free from sin. But the life vest of the Levitical law cannot set us free from the water. So just as the water no longer has dominion over those who escape from it into a boat, sin no longer has dominion over those who escape from its grasp into the Lord's glorious ship of grace. And because the Levitical law could not actually set anyone completely free from sin, John wrote, For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. But nowhere in Scripture is grace contrasted against God's moral commandments. No, grace is only ever contrasted against the foods and drinks, various washings, and fleshly ordinances that were imposed until the time of Reformation. For example, about foods, Scripture teaches, it is good that the heart be established by grace, not with foods, which have not profited those who have been occupied with them. So grace is directly contrasted against foods in the Bible, and those who judge others over their foods or preoccupy themselves with foods have not yet fully understood how the grace of God has set them free from the Levitical law. Likewise, Paul made this same point about the fleshly ordinance of circumcision in Romans. In that epistle he wrote, Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law. Or is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not also the God of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also since there is one God who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith. Then, after Paul set the stage by explaining physical circumcision was the topic he was addressing, Paul added, What then shall we say that Abraham our father has found according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Now, to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, but as debt. But to him who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness. Then Paul added, Just as David also describes the blessedness of the man to whom God imputes righteousness apart from works, blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord shall not impute sin. Does this blessedness then come upon the circumcised only or upon the uncircumcised also? For we say that faith was accounted to Abraham for righteousness. How then was it accounted? While he was circumcised or uncircumcised? 
And Paul concluded, Not while circumcised, but while uncircumcised. And Abraham received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had while still uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all those who believe, though they are uncircumcised, that righteousness might be imputed to them also, and the father of circumcision to those who not only are of the circumcision, but who also walk in the steps of faith which our father Abraham had while still uncircumcised. For the promise that Abraham would be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. Therefore it is of faith that it might be according to grace, so that the promise might be sure to all of the seed, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. You see, Paul's point in Romans 4 was all about the fleshly ordinance of circumcision and how it was not necessary to be physically circumcised to be saved. In other words, the Apostle Paul was reiterating and proving from Scripture what was decided in Acts chapter 15. So when we see grace and faith contrasted to the law and works, it's never a discouragement against obeying God's holy commandments. Certainly not. Instead, it is a discouragement against the Levitical works of the law performed in the flesh, such as circumcision, various washings, and abstinence from certain foods. This is why Paul wrote, Circumcision is nothing, and uncircumcision is nothing but keeping the commandments of God is what matters. We must remember the Apostle Paul, who warned against seeking salvation through the works of the law, also said, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision, but declared first to those in Damascus, and in Jerusalem, and throughout all the region of Judea, and then to the Gentiles, that they should repent, turn to God, and do works befitting repentance. Plus, Paul wrote to Titus, This is a faithful saying, and these things I want you to affirm constantly, that those who have believed in God should be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable to men. Untaught and unstable teachers who preach that Paul taught against good works don't understand. Paul was only against Levitical works done in the flesh. Paul was never against good works done in the Spirit's power in obedience to God's moral law. And now that we have explored the passages that contrast the Levitical law to grace, we need to continue evaluating whether the word unmerited belongs in an accurate definition of grace. And there are several more passages to consider as we answer that important question. In the Psalms, it is written, The Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from those who walk uprightly. So one way to find God's grace is to walk uprightly, according to this psalm. And the same Greek Septuagint word translated as grace in Psalm 84 is translated as favor in Proverbs, where it is written, Let not mercy and truth forsake you, but bind them about your neck. So shall you find favor, and provide things honest in the sight of the Lord, and of men. Therefore we can find grace or favor by binding mercy and truth around our necks as an ornamental necklace. Likewise, if we seek after good, we will find grace, for it is written, 
He who earnestly seeks good finds favor, but trouble will come to him who seeks evil. And this same word, often translated as grace, is here translated favor in this passage. Similarly, the same language underlies the word favor in Proverbs 12, which explains, A good man obtains favor from the Lord, but a man of wicked intentions he will condemn. Therefore, the pursuit of morally virtuous things is a pursuit of God's amazing grace. But another key way to find God's grace is through humility. Because in three separate passages we are told, The Lord resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Peter, who repeated that proverb, also used the same Greek word for grace when he wrote, For this finds God's favor, if, because of conscience towards God, someone endures hardships in suffering unjustly. For what credit is it if you sin and are mistreated and endure it? But if you do good and suffer and so endure, this finds favor with God. Truly enduring suffering while doing good is a sure way to find grace in the eyes of the Lord. So we have seen that Scripture teaches there are certain virtues and activities that are highly recommended because they find God's grace. Therefore, while we can understand why the word unmerited was added to the definition of grace, it's really not an accurate addition. Instead, a better adjective to describe how God's grace is never owed to anyone, and God could rightly judge every human being for sinning against his moral law, would be undeserved. No one deserves God's glorious grace. Instead, we all deserve God's judgment for breaking his commandments. But God is rich in mercy and full of grace. So God sent his son Jesus to save us from our sins and lead us to his kingdom. And the fact is, Jesus is the manifestation of God's glorious grace to mankind, and no one can do anything to deserve salvation by faith in Christ Jesus. But friends, God's grace is very, very important to find. Because God's grace is the only way we can be saved from sin and the terrible eternal destiny that awaits every sinner who refuses to repent and take hold of God's glorious grace. Paul explains God who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up together, and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Our sin had separated us from our Creator, the source of life, but God the Father lovingly sent Jesus his Son to save us from our sins, and when we repented and put our faith in Christ, Jesus lifted us up out of the waters of sin and placed us safely within his ship of grace. We did not deserve this rescue. No, we understand that we deserve death because we sinned against God's righteous moral laws. So even after we are safely on board the ship of salvation, we remember we could have never saved ourselves. However, we did have to respond to our Savior's voice with repentance and faith to take hold of our Lord's nail-scarred hand. And this was what Paul was teaching when he explained, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Just as the Israelites could not say that they delivered themselves from Egypt or parted the waters of the Red Sea by their own merits, we cannot say we delivered ourselves from the waters of sin. Yes, we all recognize that Jesus pulled us up out of the water when we put our trust in him, and no amount of struggling could have made us any less wet. 
Plus, we all recognize we have all sinned, and we have all broken God's moral commandments. So we were all deserving death. But God gave us grace instead of what we deserved, and for that we will sing his praises forever. So now that we understand God's grace is undeserved favor, we must remember, even though we can never actually deserve God's grace, we can seek it, find it, continue in it, fall from it, and reject it. Therefore, all of us who are already passengers on the glorious ship of grace must remember to continue on that ship. And all those who are still drowning in the waters of sin must understand, only Jesus can save you from the terrible hell that awaits all those who die in their sins. So, friend, take hold of his hand today and allow Jesus to pull you to safety away from the waters of sin that currently enslave you into dry places of righteousness and holiness that God himself dwells in. For the saving grace of God has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself a people as his own possession, zealous for good works. And this is the true grace of God, proclaimed by the Holy Scriptures, from the very first Hebrew word of Genesis to the very last Greek word of Revelation. <laughs>